COVID-19 and policy options for expanding ma mail-in ballots this November. Um, if you are not familiar with us at Nonprofit Vote, I just want to share a little bit about who we are. Uh, we work with nonprofits all across the country to get them to engage the people they serve in voting and elections. So we have a vast library of nonpartisan voter engagement resources. We do some original research such as our Engaging New Voters report, and we compile handy state-based election information in our Voting in Your State portal. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is run these webinars where we have these awesome experts, and today is no exception. So our agenda for the day, uh, we will start with the current status of vote by mail and absentee voting in the U.S. and the mechanics of getting vote by mail right. Uh, and Am Amber McReynolds uh, from the National Vote at Home Institute will be walking us through that. Uh, then we have Secretary of State Kim Wyman telling us about how we can ensure elections are accessible to all. Then Commissioner Ben Hovland from the Elections Assistance Commission uh, talking about the funding from the CARES Act uh, that the EAC has available to uh, election offices making these uh, adjustments in light of COVID. And finally, we will do our Q&A. If you have questions for our speakers, you can use the Q&A box to send us your questions. There's also a chat box and that's a good place for any feedback for us or if you're encountering some sort of technical difficulties, we may be able to uh, help you troubleshoot those. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be sent out to everyone who RSVP'd, whether you didn't get on at all or had to jump off early or got on late. Don't worry, all this content will be available to you. We'll send it out within the week. So um, since we do have a packed agenda, um, I want to introduce our first speaker uh, who is Amber McReynolds, the CEO for the National Vote at Home Institute and Coalition and the former Director of Elections for Denver, Colorado. During her time there, she transformed the Elections Division into a national and international award-winning office. She has proven that designing pro-voter policies voter-centric processes, and implementing technical innovations will improve representation for all voters. Thanks for being with us today, Amber. I'm going to stop screen sharing so that you can take us through your presentation. Great, thank you. Um, let me just get this up. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, both Brian and Caitlin and, and the nonprofit vote team. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we can deliver democracy effectively and uh, prepare for the upcoming elections. Um, and then some of the work that we're focused on at the National Vote at Home Institute with state and, and local offices. Um, the time to act is now, and as we all know, the election is upon us. Uh, I've been talking this week with various folks and reminding people that ballots are going out in about 150 days. And so the time to act is now, and we have to ensure that every voter can vote in a safe way, that we take decisive action, and, and there's immediacy around implementation and making sure that election offices have what they need to prepare for uh, the inevitable onslaught of additional mail ballots this year, uh, but also for providing in-person voting in a safe way. Um, and then political leadership to make sure that there is funding and, and resources that election officials need across the country. Um, I did want to put this picture up because I think as we all saw, we, we just saw a primary uh, play out in Wisconsin that 
um, had a lot of issues, uh, namely a lot of last minute changes and uncertainty, which made it really difficult, not only for election officials, but for voters and for many of the stakeholders that were working in, in and around the primary election. Um, some of the challenges, just as, as many of you know, but uh, this is an unprecedented crisis and it requires extraordinary creativity to solve problems. And again, ensuring that every voter can vote, the timing and the time crunch, uh, while having voters avoid public spaces and crowds, the political will in various states and also at the federal level, um, and then adjusting election administration to the new reality, while also seeing a significant reduction, not only in poll workers, but also in polling places that are, that are able and willing to offer space. Just to give everyone a quick view of the country as a whole, obviously this varies by state in terms of the procedures that are in place with regards to absentee voting or voting at home or vote by mail. Uh, this map is available on our website and then it really outlines all the different differences across various states and then we're seeing a lot of changes as primaries and, and, and whatnot modify procedures in various states as we go forward. Um, I also wanted to share just the turnout that we've seen across the country in primaries uh, and just show where voting at home has been utilized in various states and sort of what the impact of that is uh, across the board. Uh, you can see on this slide that Washington uh, has right now the highest turnout in the country, uh, as well as followed closely by Colorado and Wisconsin, uh, and then California. All of those states either primarily mailed a ballot out to every elector or had the method of voting be uh, well over 66% uh, in those primaries. So all of them were conducted in either March or even more recently and had relatively high turnout uh, because they were using a, a safe method like uh, voting by mail and offering that to their constituents. And you can see other states that were around the same time. So Illinois' turnout fell quite dramatically um, because of COVID and because of the lack of mail ballot voting that they um, had predominantly in use across the state. Um, our organization has put out some, uh, some ways that states could uh, expand and prepare for higher volumes in vote by mail. Um, because elections are more localized, there's over 8,000 localities that run elections across the US. So expanding significantly or scaling up significantly across that many jurisdictions can be challenging. So we've also put out some uh, recommendations and just ideas about how states could potentially leverage centrali centralizing or regionalizing or trying to uh, share resources across multiple jurisdictions. Um, and just some of the ways that, that you can help, I know there's a lot of organizations on the call, um, but sharing the message and, and uh, information about options that voters have, supporting local election officials and signing up to be an election judge or, or offering your support is helpful. Uh, following our work, we have a communications list where we regularly send out information about voting. Uh, joining as a stakeholder is also really helpful to us. Encouraging your state legislatures as well as your governors and other state leadership to uh, support expansion of options for voters to vote in a safe and secure way. Uh, engaging on voter education efforts in your respective states. And if you are hosting webinars, inviting us to, to share these plans or to share information about the, about the process overall. Um, and then finally, we have a, a, quite a few resources on our website uh, that, that are useful. Our website is voteathome.org. Uh, we have a reference library where we combine all of the research and policy guidance, best practices, uh, trainings for election judges and, tra and trainings for election officials all on our, in our reference library. We also have a strategic plan that I referenced in this presentation. We have a document that we call myths. So it sort of outlines the myths associated with voting by mail and voting at home. Um, and then we recently just put out a, a brief on equity and making sure that the system is equitable for all voters across the board. Uh, so with that, I'll stop there and I'm sure some of the next panelists will come up. Thank you, Amber, um, for sharing those with us. Um, I do ha want to take a moment to um, address a couple of the questions that we are seeing. Um, already folks are 
asking some great questions. I do just want to remind folks to put any questions for our panelists in the Q&A box. Uh, it's an icon at the bottom that has two little speech bubbles. Uh, we're using that for Q&A. We're using the chat for any feedback that you might have for us. Um, so let me um, once again share my slides with you all. Okay. So, um, so the first thing I'm hoping that you can speak to, Amber, is um, a question we have from Marilyn about opponents who say that um, vote by mail is abused by um, illegal aliens or non-residents. Um, and is there any nonpartisan research that shows it's not true and anything that we can um, uh, use to fight back against that assumption that vote by mail is abused in that way? Um, sure. We we have on our website, we actually have in our myths uh, FAQ some, some um, uh, information about some of those sorts of talking points that we've heard uh, circulated. Um, and then uh, all I would say is, look, it, it, it's really important how the system is implemented. And one of the recommendations that we make to states regularly and that has been utilized in states that have a lot of vote by mail is a tool called ballot tracking. Um, and there's uh, our partners in Democracy Works has um, a tool called Ballot Scout and there's other versions of the ballot tracking solution. And so um, that is a good way to um, make sure that voters know where their ballot is at every moment in time. It's just like uh, uh, the same type of system where you track a FedEx or a UPS package, you can do so for your ballot envelope and it gives you that full accountability and transparency. So it, it helps to enhance security around these sorts of systems. Great. Um, and so speaking of security, um, what's the process uh, for keeping the ballots secure and making sure that they're not accidentally lost? Uh, lost by voters or lost in the mail or what? Uh, well, why don't we start with um, I think there's another question somewhere about if voters lose the ballot. So let's start oh, with sure. if they're, once they've been mailed, once sure. a voter has put it in the mailbox, how do we keep track of those? <laughs> yeah, so the, the ballot tracking tool I met is a great, uh, that I mentioned is a great tool for that. And then if a voter does have a challenge where maybe they don't receive it, this is why in-person voting is important to ensure that uh, voters can take care of issues like that or they can also request another ballot be mailed as long as there's time to do that. So those are sort of ways that that, that can happen. And one of the most important things that voters can be sure of when, when they're uh, either signing up for a vote by mail ballot or in a state that does this is make sure their address is up to date because that's really important to uh, also ensure the integrity of the system and, and ensure that your ballot makes it to you uh, so that um, so that you can engage with it. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, another question is, do all states have vote by mail options? Yeah, so every state in the country right now has some form of absentee voting. Uh, the map that I had put up um, kind of out, we sort of, we categorize states into five different buckets. Um, um, uh, the sort of top step five, if you, if you will, is, is a state that mails a ballot to everyone, such as Utah or Washington or Colorado. Um, then there's sort of from there, it's uh, no excuse, meaning you can sign up for a ballot. And that's where the majority of states are. They're either, uh, they have a permanent way to do that or they have a no excuse required. And then down from there, there's the states that have excuses still required like in Alabama or South Carolina or Tennessee or Texas. They still have where you have to prove basically a reason for getting an absentee ballot. And that's the most restrictive uh, that we see in states that are in that step one or step two category. Thank you. Uh, this is a great question from Jean. Does vote at home work with same day registration? 
Yes, actually, uh, in Colorado, when we passed our reform, which is now seven years ago, uh, we combined same day registration with mailing a ballot to all electors in advance. And the way that we accommodate that is by uh, the ballots go out uh, and are continually mailed as you get to a week before the election. And then Colorado opens vote centers for the early voting period as well as on election day. So that if you do need to register to vote or update your address, and maybe you didn't receive your ballot because of that, you can vote in person all the way through election day while also taking care of the registration issue. Great. So I think this that sort of gets at um, Richard's question, but just to make it crystal clear, uh, he asks, is mail at home voting an all or nothing proposition? Are there hybrid systems that have both mail in and voting at the polls? So it sounds yeah. like yes. Yeah. In fact, all the states that uh, it's really about mailing a ballot to every elector in advance. But that that doesn't mean that you don't have some sort of in-person voting or some level of that and in all the states that we say are are sort of that step five category they all offer in-person voting during the early voting period and on election day so it's not like in-person voting doesn't exist and in our in our advocacy work we we like to say that we want a hundred percent of the voters to get mailed a ballot in advance but we also want to make sure that in-person voting options including drop boxes and those sorts of things exist during the early voting period and also on election day. Excellent. Um, so we, there are tons of questions. I still need to sort of review and, and, and figure them out. Oh, but here's, here's one that um, I think we'll do this one last one before we get on to our next speaker. Um, we have a question, um, do you know if the states that vote by mail have accessible ballot for people who are blind or visually impaired, such as braille or large print? Yes, uh, yes they do, and it varies by state, but I'll give an example of a, of a great model that California and also Utah have in that they uh, require an accessible vote at home option. So it's similar to what voters can utilize if they're in the military or, or overseas, where they can get a, that accessible ballot um, at home. And then it, it is required in both California, and I'm not sure about Utah, but in California, at least you have to print that. Once you mark it on your home device, you, you have to print that to then mail it in and, and turn the ballot back in. Um, but there are those unique uh, situations in various states and there's different solutions out there that that help with that. Uh, there's also states that will provide a braille ballot if it's requested or, or provide other accessible means uh, to ensure voters can vote. Excellent. So I think that's a really nice transition to talk about um, keeping elections accessible um, to transition into our next Speaker. So, um, Amber, if you can hang on, because I'm sure you'll be called on to answer many more of these questions um, sure. in the future. Uh, but next, I want to introduce Kim Wyman, Washington's 15th Secretary of State. First elected in 2012, she is serving her second term and is only the second female Secretary of State in Washington's history. Prior to being elected to this office, Kim served as Thurston County Elections Director for nearly a decade and was elected Thurston County Auditor from 2001 to 2013. Kim also sits on the steering committee for National Voter Registration Day. Um, and so we are a big fan of, of her work in Washington and our, her help with National Voter Registration Day. So we are happy to have you here, Kim, and I know we pulled you away from another meeting. So I'll let you take it away and tell us about some lessons from Washington and how we can keep our elections accessible. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Caitlin and, and Brian for having me on this call. And I'm a big fan, of course, of the work that uh, Nonprofit Vote does and, and National Voter Registration Day and all of it. So uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on this call. 
Um, I thought I would start first by giving the timeline and, and the evolution that Washington went through in becoming a vote by mail state, because I think it's, it's a, there's a lot of lessons we learned the hard way that I think uh, states that are wrestling with this issue now can uh, take away from it. And, um, and I, I hope we can all be successful this fall. So um, let me start with the kind of the overarching point I want to make is that this didn't happen overnight. In fact, it took decades in Washington state and we, we really were way ahead of the curve uh, in 1983, allowing uh, voters with disabilities or um, people 65 and over to uh, have a permanent absentee status. And so that meant for about a decade, um, we, we ran about two to 3% of our ballots were permanent absentee voters and, and returned them that way. And uh, in 1991 was a really pivotal year because our legislature passed not only motor voter, but it expanded permanent absentee status to all voters. And that law went into effect in 1993. And um, we saw a real ramp up just naturally from that. And some counties like mine really did promote that. So it resulted in very high uh, percentages of permanent absentee voters. In fact, in my county by 1996, 60% of our voters were getting a permanent absentee ballot. And um, this meant that we were conducting two elections simultaneously every time we had an election at the polling place. Um, you had to prepare fully for vote by mail and then fully for uh, poll site voting. And this came to a head and became very sharp, clear uh, focus for our, our state in 2004 when we had the closest governor's race in the country's history had a lot of problems with polling places, had a lot of problems with uh, absentee ballots. And in 2005, as a reform, our legislature allowed us by county to move to vote by mail. So our state wanted to move to vote by mail in 2005, and it still took five years for the state to completely move to vote by mail. Our last statewide vote by mail election was in 2010, and it, it it was two holdout counties, uh, and one was because of size. They were our two biggest counties, uh, King County where Seattle is, uh, they just needed that time to build out the infrastructure to be able to deal with the nearly 1 million ballots uh, or voters that they have in their county. Um, and then Pierce County where Tacoma is, was the last county and that had more to do with politics. Um, they had had an auditor who really forced vote by mail and um, uh, their voters hated it. So anyway, long story short, some of the lessons that we learned is, um, and let me tell you kind of about our system. We mail ballots out. Uh, they have to be in the mail 18 days before the election, but they're available 20 days before. So we have a 20 day voting window for our voters. And what this really does is it gives us a lot of time to deal with issues and problems. Um, we you know, do a lot of uh, voter outreach to let people know ballots are mailed. And so if they're not, if they haven't received it by a certain date, we would tell them, hey, call your co county election officials and, uh, and get a ballot. Uh, it would be you know, good and try to do that way, well before election day. Um, we, I, I can tell you having done this for a long time, the two criticisms we receive uh, most often are that the stamp on the ballot is a poll tax and that my mail carrier can see my signature and I think that that has a potential for um, some sort of fraud or um, uh, ID theft. So um, the thing that kind of evolved for us in the 90s, and, and I think I might have been the one who started it, is we, um, we started doing ballot drop boxes. And so now across the state of Washington, we have about 500 ballot drop boxes. And thanks to uh, King County trying to do um, prepaid postage in 2018. Um, I worked with our governor and we have uh, prepaid postage now for all elections statewide. Um, and these are two critical part, points because it gives voters an option. And if they're worried about their signature, they can put it in a drop box. If they're worried about the poll tax, they can put it in the mail and it's, a, it's just a good thing. We also do have the, the accessible online voting option that you heard um, Amber talk about for people who um, may need to use their own device to mark their ballot or maybe serving overseas in the military or as a civilian. And, um, and then we also translate many of our ballots and ballot materials into, of course, the, the uh, Section 5 languages. But um, we, on demand, will do things like uh, translate into Braille. We have the talking book in Braille library here in my 
office. So uh, we do provide those services and provide a voter's pamphlet, in fact, in Braille. But we uh, we tailor a lot of that. We have audio pamphlets. So a lot of it is, is kind of customized based on the needs of our voters and is coordinated with our counties. Um, as Amber said, we do have vote centers that are open for accessible voting, and uh, you need to be able to do things like get replacement ballots or um, register to vote. And we do have same day registration uh, that we implemented for the first time in 2019. So I will let you know how that goes in the crush of 2020. Um, one of the things our state also did is, is we have a statewide voter registration system now that is nearly live time. So um, when people come in and, and register on election day, uh, we are doing a check on their, their driver's license or their ID card and um, with the Department of Licensing. And we're kind of building in some of that, some of those criticisms that you hear on the fraud side. Um, those are built into our system. Um, I guess some of the pros that I haven't spoke about, we have a paper ballot system, which is audible. Um, we have uh, mandatory recounts and, and some counties are actually doing, um, I'm blanking on the term. Yes, um, risk limiting audits. And, um, you know, so we have those security measures in place to try to instill confidence. I think the challenges that we're seeing with COVID-19 are very similar to what the rest of the country is seeing. So, so make no mistake, vote by mail or, or expanded absentee balloting is not the end all be all only solution. I think it is part of many solutions states are gonna have to come up with. Um, the biggest thing is first and foremost, um, you still need the same number of staff to process ballots on both the mail outside and the receiving side as you do in a polling place environment on election day. And the biggest difference is now you need those workers from 30 to 60 days prior to election day and then as much as 20 days after election day to do that processing. And you also uh, need to have the space and the equipment to be able to do that, that volume of uh, increased transactions you're gonna have by mail. Um, so high speed sorters, high speed um, uh, equipment to deal with that, and maybe even using third party vendors for mailing services or ballot mailing and printout. Um, so, and then, then finally, I think the, the thing that's a challenge is the later results. This is our biggest complaint from the media and campaigns because uh, we have a 10 day certification window and here in Washington state, you have, have to just have a valid postmark of election day. So we receive about half of the ballots in an, in an election cycle on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of election week. And that's very significant because you have to have that capacity to build that out. And that's one of my concerns with um, the states that have never really dealt with a lot of absentees or vote by mail is how are you, do you have enough time on the back end of the election to process all of the volume that you're going to see that comes in election week. Um, and then finally, I guess just to end on the, the fraud note, um, you know, I know there's been a lot of things set out uh, out in the, the social media sphere and, and uh, out, in, out in the world, I guess, that uh, vote by mail is very fraudulent and, and we, you know, absentee ballots are fraudulent. Um, that has not been our experience in Washington because we took a lot of time to build in the compensating controls to instill confidence and answer those questions. So uh, every ballot that's returned in Washington, the signature on the outside envelope is compared to the signature on the voter registration record. Um, and we have about 4.5 million registered voters in our state. So uh, you need to have that capacity to deal with that efficiently. Another thing that I'm worried about with states is, is that they have that equipment and they have those signatures di digitized. Um, so all of our counties actually can pull those signatures up electronically. They scan the image of the incoming ballot in and compare it to the image of the, the reg registration record. Um, so that's a, something that's gonna have to be built out in the next six months for uh, states that are gonna be moving to this. And then I think the most important thing we do is that we reconcile all of the ballots received um, and account for every single one of them. And this is very, very important on that instilling confidence and a couple of questions have kind of alluded to it. How do, you know, how do we know you didn't just throw out ballots? You, you know that these ballots are gonna be against this campaign or this, this candidate. Um, the reconciliation happens from the moment the ballots come into the facility and uh, at certification, every ballot you can tell not only if it was counted or if it was rejected, why it was rejected and who actually had 
contact with that ballot at any point in the process. Uh, you build in a lot of dual control measures, logs, and uh, some physical and, and cybersecurity uh, measures that really protect that process and create an audit trail so that if anyone does call into question the closest governor's race in the history of the country, you can show and demonstrate that it was um, very secure and very accessible. Okay, so I think I've talked enough and I think I hit all the points that you were, were hoping to. That was great, thank you. Um, if you can stick around, we do have a couple questions specifically for you. Sure. Um, so uh, Irving is wondering, what are the top five languages that Washington ballots are translated to? <laughs> oh man, you're putting me on the spot here, off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Oh boy, now uh, those ones are the easy ones. I know that there's, I think Chinese, I'm gonna, I'm gonna split the, the baby here. I think that we do Mandarin and um, Cantonese, but uh, th those are the most common ones that, that are, and a couple of those, I know Chinese in King County is a section five language. And then we have three other counties that Spanish is a, is a um, requirement, so. Great. Um, I love this question from Reynaldo. It's very it's interesting to me. Uh, Reynaldo asks, how do you manage close of election for the drop boxes? Ah, so oh. in Arizona, they have like a requirement, um, polls and drop boxes close at a certain time. So do you need to have like 500 workers standing at each of those 500 drop boxes to close them at a set time? Uh, yes, you do, and um, and so we have uh, we we have all of those workers on some sort of cell phone device that in each county they're they're all using a uniform device, so they're all closing promptly at eight o'clock. Um, usually, they will have two people who do that that locking. Um, to uh, deal with the, especially this fall, when you have a long line of cars or people, uh, you wanna get that last person at line at eight o'clock and collect those ballots, put them in and secure them. And then when those ballots actually get picked up and emptied out of those drop boxes, we have two people. So it is a minimum of 500 people because they just need to put a lock on the, the kind of door to, to put the ballots into the box. And then a lot of times they'll wait 30 minutes, let the, the line go away, and then they'll come back and empty the box with two people with a, a series of logs and security controls to make sure that you can show, you know, how many ballots you took out of the box and what you did with them. Wow. Um, so quite a coordinated effort. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, here's a, a two-parter. I'm going to combine sort of combine two questions. Um, and uh, so I know that Washington has online voter registration. Mm -hmm. And so those have, t and, but this person is asking, you know, since those have type signatures, how could they be compared to the envelope signature? And then um, the follow up is, uh, what are the opportunities voters have to cure um, a mismatched signature? Thank you, that is a great question. I meant to say that in my opening remarks. Um, for our online and our agency-based, uh, and motor voter for that matter, um, signature gathering, uh, let me let me stop, receive that. For online, you have to have a Washington driver's license or ID card because um, they capture the, the applicant's signature at that time when they get a driver's license or a, an ID card. So on the online portal, we can go to DOL and we can get that, that signature and put it into our system. Um, but but that's a um, that's the the problem with uh, with online is that we do need to get the signature. So that was our solution for that piece. And most of our um, I think most of our voters are still able to get online just by the the data. Most of our voters provide an ID or um, a Washington State driver's license. Um, and uh, in terms of gosh, what was the second part of the question? How can a voter cure um, a mismatched yeah. signature? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we go through and the people that are checking the signatures are at the counties and they are trained annually by the state patrol on, uh, you know, how to see commonalities in signatures. And if they don't match, they go through a couple of series of, of checks before they notify the voter. But every single one that's called into question, the voter sent a letter and get and given the opportunity to um, resubmit their signature, essentially re-sign the oath. And then if... Um, 
if that is still not matching, then it goes to the county canvassing board. Uh, if the signature isn't cured, it's go to, to the county canvassing board, which is made of three up of three independently elected officials, and then they have to agree to reject it by a majority. Um, and that that check really serves two purposes. One, just to give the second chance to the voter, but it also is a, another fraud measure um, because if a voter has not returned their ballot and they get a letter from the county auditor saying, hey, your signature doesn't match, the voter can contact the county auditor and say, hey, I haven't returned my ballot. That's not me. And then that, that can start an investigation. And I can tell you that the auditors take it seriously and they do investigate um, any claims of fraud or, or duplicate voting. And they do um, turn those over to the sheriff and, and prosecute them with the prosecuting attorney. Well, thank you. Thank you for all this information about how it's done in Washington. Um, I know states across the country are looking to you all to see you know, what what changes they need to make, how they can put this in place. So I really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Sure, well, thanks for having me. All right, so I do want to get to our um, third and final speaker. Um, our, uh, so Ben Hovland has served as the commissioner to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission since January 2019. Ben's 20-year career in elections has been shaped by his commitment to improving election administration and removing barriers to voting. Most recently, he served as Acting Chief Counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, where he was a driving force behind Congress appropriating $380 million in the Help America Vote Act funds to enhance election security to the states in 2018. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Oh, we don't hear you. I'm going to un unmute you. Oh, thanks, Caitlin. And uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to join Nonprofit Vote and this great group of speakers in discussing uh, this important topic. Uh, just, uh, I know we've got a lot, of, a lot of participants on the webinar today. So uh, just in case some people aren't familiar with the AC, I'd give a, a brief overview that we are a small federal agency created by the Help America Vote Act of 2002. That was Congress's response to the Florida 2000 election. Uh, and we're tasked with a number of things, but, but sort of most notably on a high level, we uh, are tasked with giving out grant money from Congress, as you mentioned. Uh, we also work on uh, the voluntary voting system guidelines, which are uh, a series of guidelines that voting equipment in the country uh, is often built to. And then we have a testing and certification program with that. And then finally, and sort of most relevant to today's conversation, uh, Congress tasked us with a clearinghouse function uh, where we uh, collect and try to disseminate best practices in election administration around the country. And so sort of in this time of the, of the novel coronavirus and COVID-19, uh, certainly it's presenting um, unprecedented challenges around our country. And of course, the election administration community uh, is in the thick of determining how to, to best conduct elections in this environment. And at the EAC, uh, we've pivoted substantially to focus our attention on how we can support state and local election officials as they make tough decisions about their primaries in the general election. Uh, we've done this by working uh, within the critical infrastructure subsector. Uh, this is a, a new development since January of 17, uh, but we've been working within that framework on a number of products. Uh, the EAC is leading a joint working group between the Government Coordinating Council and the Sector Coordinating Council. Uh, you know, essentially what that means is that we have state and local election officials along with private industry experts working with staff from the EAC and the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency, or CISA, on a number of documents that address uh, considerations and best practices for voting during the pandemic. Uh, the EAC has also hosted a number of Zoom videos or web chats where we bring together experts from the elections field to discuss best practices and lessons learned on particular topics. Uh, as an additional plug for these videos, my two co-panelists today have each served as experts on these EAC videos. And so, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that these videos and the other resources I mentioned can help with the unique challenges that election officials are facing. Uh, but I also believe that they can be a resource for this community and the participants on this call to provide useful information and background 
on election administration considerations that must be taken into account. Uh, you know, I, I've been in this uh, space in one way or another for over 20 years and, and reading through these documents as we were putting them together, uh, I can't tell you how much I've learned. So certainly a great resource uh, on the slide that's up there. Uh, you can see on our website uh, that we've got that there and certainly encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, but ultimately with the 50 states running elections 50 different ways, each state is in a different place and in determining the best ways for their state to proceed. Uh, we certainly see that in the grant request letters that we've been receiving from the states as we distribute the $400 million in CARES Act funding that Congress provided for elections. Uh, the CARES Act was signed into law on March 27th. Uh, I'm pleased to report that the EAC awarded all 56 CARES Act grants on April 6th. That's the 50 uh, states and then six territories. Uh, and by April 20th or Monday, 48 states and territories had requested disbursement of the funds and submitted descriptions of their anticipated activities. Uh, the few remaining states have been in communication with us uh, and they're gonna submit request letters after they get approval from their state legislature or their state board. Uh, in a few cases, states require a legislative vote on the required 20% match or other authorization before they can request uh, or submit their request. Uh, and in almost all these cases, the states expect their internal processes to be completed by June. Uh, and regardless of any of, of that, the actual, or regardless of the actual disbursement date of the funds, uh, states are able to, they have the authority to start obligating uh, funds as of March 28th, when uh, the day after the law was signed. Uh, and so that way, any expenses from March 28th forward, uh, they're able to pay uh, with this federal money. Um, and so in our communications, just to give the list, your listeners uh, a chance to, to hear what we've been hearing in our communications with the states regarding the CARES Act funding, uh, we've heard that election officials are anticipating a wide array of costs associated with responding to this pandemic. Uh, for example, costs associated with increased teleworking uh, for staff, such as laptops and mobile IT equipment. Uh, most commonly, we're hearing about increased costs associated with absentee or mail ballots, uh, costs like increased printing and postage, additional processing equipment, high-speed scanners and drop boxes. Uh, but these costs also include systematic upgrades to allow for online absentee ballot requests or to expand state portals to ensure voters with disabilities have access uh, to tools that can enable expanded use of absentee or mail ballots. Um, also, we've heard about increased needs around uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, uh, deep cleaning of polling places, sanitizing supplies, and expanding curbside access. Uh, clearly, there's no shortage of needs um, or work to be done. I think today's conversation has highlighted an important part uh, about how, uh, uh, how much of that work needs to be done and how much uh, everyone's help is needed here. And as a final thought, um, you know, I know a number of the organizations, I hope all of them, uh, on this call are active with National Voter Registration Day. But, uh, you know, as Amber flagged earlier, there really is a need uh, to push people to update their registration information. Uh, DMVs, which are the largest source of voter registrations and updates, have been closed in a number of states or had their hours reduced. Uh, and so with 40 states having online registration, there's a real opportunity to drive people to check their registration and update anything that's out of date. Uh, and additionally, that's an opportunity for folks to uh, be encouraged to familiarize themselves with how to get an absentee or mail ballot in their state. Uh, and while there may be some changes in state procedures, uh, certainly helping educate and organize voters will also be crucial to conducting elections in 2020. And with that, I wanna thank Nonprofit Vote Again for including me and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you say you're looking forward to questions, Ben, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, thank you for for that presentation. So um, let's. Uh, so, so there's a lot of questions here. So I'm going to go through a couple of these that I think um, are really good ones for you. Well, first of all, first off, someone asked if there's any way to know which states have not yet applied 
um, which of which someone thinks it's five states that have not yet applied for that funding. Can you share that information with us or where somebody would be able to find that? So on the EAC's website, there's a page that's dedicated to CARES Act funding. Uh, you're able to access that pretty quickly from EAC.gov. On the front page, on the right side, there's a, a link. Uh, and within that, it's got information about the grant money and it has the state request letters there that people can see. Uh, we generally get those loaded up pretty quickly once we've received them. Uh, you know, there is there is somewhat of a, uh, you know, there may be a, a 24 hour or so lag. Uh, we also process them pretty quickly. Again, from for the states that have not uh, submitted official requests yet, they've all asked for extensions and those really have to do with state legislative processes for the most part or or state processes that are in place that are necessary um, for the chief election official to uh, formally be able to request or accept federal funding. Thank you for that. Um, someone is asking if, um, if the funding appropriated by Congress runs out, can private entities in, like businesses, individuals, or philanthropy provide such funding to assist with paid postage, ballot scanners, sanitation supplies, et cetera? I would say that that's going to be a state-by-state -state, uh, issue, depending on parameters for uh, state and local election officials and what their gift laws and rules are. Okay, so so got a the answer will vary by state. Um, overall, it, do you know is there a significant cost difference to um, between voting by mail and in person? Um, and Amber, you may want to tag team on this one as well. Uh, this is Ben. I jump in and just say. Uh, you know, I think that the cost difference and, and what we're going to see right now, certainly I think my understanding and, <laughs> and Amber and Secretary Wyman know more about this than me, but I'd say there's ultimately a cost savings, it seems like, with vote by mail. But what we are, or vote at home, uh, once you are fully implemented, I think what we're going to see a lot of this year are increased costs for most jurisdictions uh, because they'll be running dual elections. Uh, somewhat like Secretary Wyman mentioned as, as they ramped up in Washington, uh, where you are still having um, a polling place election, but you're having an increased uh, vote by mail, vote at home, absentee experience. Uh, and so you have, you'll be really running dual elections. And that's certainly why there are some real fiscal challenges associated with this. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, we continue to hear uh, you know, Congress appropriated this $400 million, which is great, uh, but certainly what I've been hearing from state and local election officials is they expect uh, the needs to be much higher than that, uh, and a big portion of that comes into play because while state and local election officials are primarily responsible for running elections and primarily responsible for funding elections, uh, you know, people, uh, the state and local budgets to run the 2020 election were based on a traditional model of how they were going to run the election. And now what we're seeing uh, is people are going to be running, uh, you know, at least dual elections plus additional costs associated with uh, making polling places as safe as possible, potentially relocating polling places away from uh, senior centers and other or locations that are no longer available. Uh, and so there really is going to be a significant cost that's above and beyond what was anticipated or budgeted at the state or local level. And this is Amber. Um, yeah, so for the most part, the, the research and data that's looked at, you know, a system like where Colorado implemented a, vo a primarily vote by mail program with still vote centers, in-person voting and uh, same day registration, that found that when that implementation happened, uh, the Pew Research Center analyzed costs across counties and found a 40% reduction in administrative costs. That being said, that was the full shift to, you know, mailing everyone a ballot along with vote centers instead of polling places in that kind of program. 
But so I think Ben is exactly right in what Secretary Wyman said is also exactly right in that where basically right now jurisdictions are seeing a significant increase of voters requesting the ballot, but still having to provide the level of polling places and sort of the other programs that they're doing, the costs will be very high this year because they're, the pressure is sort of happening across the board. Um, and then the final thing I would say about costs is one of the suggestions that we've been making at the federal level to alleviate uh, some of the stress of the costs on local election officials is for the federal government to actually expand what they already do for military and overseas voters and that they pay for outbound and inbound postage. So that's covered at the federal level. It's, it happens in every single state right now for military and overseas voters. And our suggestion has been to expand that to domestic voters so that it would elimi eliminate that stress off of localities that pay for the postage for outbound and also inbound in many circumstances now and create consistency across the board and across the country. So that's one of the suggestions we have that would immediately help local officials. Thank you. Um, so we have many more questions than I think we'll be able to answer today, but I, I'm seeing uh, two big trends that we'll try to get to. So one, and Amber, you mentioned the Postal Service, um, one is about USPS and um, concerns about um, the, the Postal Service uh, running out of funds and no longer operating. Um, how does that factor in? Are, are states thinking about this? And uh, if that were to happen, would vote by mail still be feasible? Yeah, that, that has come up. What I would say is that when you look at the United States Post Office, I mean, first off, the regulation of it is in the Constitution. So, you know, for, for it to go away, there's a whole nother discussion with regards to, to that. But second off, um, what I would also say about the um, Post Office is that it, as an institution, is the most trusted government-run institution in the country. It has a favorability rating above the National Park Service, NASA, and various other uh, institutions. Also, it when you look at the percentage of material that goes through the post office that's, that's vote by mail or absentee ballots, it's a blip compared to the larger um, amount of mail that goes through the post office that's more specific to businesses or medical supplies or medicine getting out there. And like when the post office, I think the number is around 350 billion pieces of mail a year we're, when we're talking about, you know, potentially adding up to 250 million ballots at the max, it's a, it's a small piece of, of, of what they're, um, of, of what they do. So I think that we have to look at the post office as being, um, it, you know, there's a much larger impact of the post office in terms of businesses, rural communities, medicine, medical delivery, all of that across the country than just mail ballots. Thank you. Um, uh, ben or Kim, anything you wanted to weigh in on there about the uh, Postal service and and use of that for vote by mail. I think Amber did a great job. Yeah, I think Amber hit pretty much everything I was thinking. <laughs> I mean, it, I do think it needs to be considered in the CARE Act funding, CARES Act funding, because um, states like my, you know, the five states that are all vote by mail, we have to have a delivery system, and uh, we have we do have coop plans in place, uh, continuity of operation plans, and uh, it, we may have to rely on other carriers, but it really needs to be funded. Great. So the other sort of category of questions that I'm seeing coming up is really about um, different things that make voting by mail feel less accessible. So um, for voters with disabilities, um, for voters who are concerned about their signatures not matching, uh, uh, voters in states where um, a notary is needed or a witness is needed. So just um, I, I'm sure Vote at Home um, has a lot of guidance about how, you know, these this can be done to be as accessible to everyone as po 
as possible. But for I'm just thinking, you know, for people who are, you know, advocating for and thinking about these folks with um, that that may face barriers to voting by mail, um, and maybe even face barriers with with regular in person voting. Um, what what would you say to them about how they can um, make the case for their election offices to really consider um, the needs of these folks? How should they go about that? Um, what are some resources that they might be able to look to? I realize that's a, a lot in one question. <laughs> Um, I, well, I can answer that. I, um, uh, we have two studies and we also have a graph on our website that shows the, the, the gap in terms of turnout for voters with disabilities is actually smaller in states that mail a ballot to every voter, primarily because transportation is often the biggest barrier, if you will, that the voters with, with disabilities face, especially in rural communities and, and different communities around uh, the country. So, so the, the graph and the data actually shows that there's a smaller gap in turnout uh, for voters with disabilities in states that automatically mail a ballot to every voter versus states where you have to have an excuse or all of that. They have a much higher gap in turnout, even though they might have a lot more polling places, they still have a larger gap in turnout because they haven't solved the transportation problem. Um, the other thing I would say is, as Kim mentioned, and then also as what California and Utah have, ensuring that there's an accessible vote at home option is critical to making sure that the system works for all, just like uh, offering in-person voting solutions and service to voters in assisted living or nursing home environments or county jails or any voter that might face otherwise, you know, logistical challenges uh, or potentially homeless voters making sure the program serves all voters and has solutions for all voters is critical. And I think what is uh, important to note is that states that have, you know, advanced their systems in terms of delivering a ballot to voters have also added services on what I just mentioned, like servicing voters in jails that might be serving a sentence that still makes them eligible to vote or assisted living locations. Those same programs have not been adopted in states that still rely heavily on for instance, outdated polling places where you have to go to the government assigned location that may be close to home, but maybe not close to work, right? So uh, what I would, I would say, and, and I think the data shows this, is that, that the states that have adopted uh, vote at home programs automatically mail in a ballot have closed and solved a lot of those issues that, um, that, that voters have faced in other states where those haven't been uh, solved. Thank you. Um, you know, as I said, we still have uh, many questions um, in, in the question box, and uh, I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer all of them, but we will save these questions and try to address as many of them as possible in our follow-up, um, primarily by providing awesome links from the EAC and from Vote at Home, um, because they are both just a treasure trove of resources um, and information. So um, as we close out, I just want to thank all our speakers today, Amber McReynolds, Kim Wyman, and Ben Hovland for um, lending their expertise and knowledge and being so very helpful. Uh, we will get these this recording, the slides, including Amber's video, um, and you know, answers to some of these questions out to you within the next week or so. Um, so thank you all for attending.